Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of uh, Conversations About COVID-19 Plus More. And this time I have my two colleagues, uh, Jonathan Jerry and uh, Emily Shore, minding the store and also uh, uh, getting into some of the discussion here uh, today. And uh, COVID isn't gone. <laughs> the trouble that Trump predicted has not happened. The hot weather didn't take it away. Unfortunately. But, but you have come to the right place because we are all knowledgeable and we have mental powers which are unparalleled. We can predict the future. Let me demonstrate it. What we have here is this uh, fish that I can manipulate with my mind. Just watch this. Put it down. Concentrating on it. You need to raise your hand a little bit. Look at that. There, there we go. go. Wow. <laughs> All by mental power, but helped by Emily's and Jonathan's mental power as well. Yes. Right. So as you can see, we are all knowledgeable. We know everything. And we'll try to clarify the situation for you. First, let me start with an email that I just got a couple of minutes ago. <clears throat> a gentleman says that he goes out for a walk with his wife uh, every day, which of course is a very good thing to do. And I, I guess they must be seniors, judging that from the tone of the letter. And he wears a hat when he goes out, and he has also keys in his pocket. And the question was, when he comes home, should he wash his hands before of the hat and putting his keys down, or after taking off the hat and putting the keys down? <laughs> what is interesting about this is, is, is sort of the, the minute detail that people are interested in and are worried about. And uh, I understand these worries because we know so little about how this thing is transmitted. I think in this case, you're not likely to catch COVID from your hat. So whether you wash your hands hatted or de-hatted, I don't think that it matters. But I think it's a good idea to wash your hands when you come home because you don't know what kind of stuff that you've, you've touched. But, but uh, the keys and the hat, I don't think are a big concern. But I start with this because, you know, it's just interesting kind of things that... Uh, people are, are interested in. Uh, something else that just happened within you know the last couple of hours is the new Brunswick legislation uh, did not pass a bill uh, that would have said uh, that you cannot have religious or philosophical uh, exemptions for vaccination. And uh, so it was defeated, which means that, that you can object and don't have to have your kids uh, uh, vaccinated, which means that herd immunity is at uh, at risk. So Jonathan, maybe a, a, again, just to make sure that people understand, uh, describe what we mean by herd immunity. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and the phrase herd immunity is, is sort of frowned upon by, by certain people in science communication. I think it's better to talk about community immunity because otherwise it makes you sound like a bunch of animals. Uh, but it's this idea that you know, the virus needs to transmit itself from person to person. Uh, but the more people are immunized against the disease, either because they've had it and now they've developed antibodies against it, or because they've received a vaccine against it and now they have antibodies against it, uh, the more of these people exist in a community, the harder it will be for any infected individual within the community to transmit it to other people. And so you end up breaking the chain of infection uh, so that the virus can sort of you know, go away, essentially. Right. And when we talk about the MMR vaccine, you have to have a very, very high degree of community immunity because this uh, this virus uh, um, is transmitted very, very easily. You, you can have one infected person coming to a room and, and infect 30 people uh, just like that. That doesn't happen with, with uh, the coronaviruses that we've been talking about, but it certainly happens with the measles virus. And uh, I think the statistics are that in order to be really protected, you need about 97% of the population uh, uh, vaccinated for, for measles. And uh, if you allow for the religious and philosophical exemptions, uh, it can fall below that. Now, of course, uh, people argue about freedom, that you should have the freedom to, to do what, what you like. But uh, freedom does not really mean that you can do whatever you like, uh, because we have to look at society at large, and it's not only the individual. If you're making a decision for yourself, let's say that you don't want a blood transfusion, 
the only person at risk is yourself and you choose to go to the other world, it's your choice. However, when you are talking about measles vaccines and not having your child vaccinated, it means you're also putting some others at risk. So I think this falls into, into a different uh, category. What I also found very surprising about this New Brunswick vote is that three of the Green Party uh, candidates in the legislature uh, abstained from this vote. I don't understand hmm. this, you know, how you abstain from a, a vote like this. But the Green Party does things that are uh, kind of strange. <laughs> okay. Anyway, Jonathan, uh, you've been looking into a couple of things. Uh, one is uh, essential oils because these are being promoted uh, on the internet and also by multi-level marketing companies. And uh, some of them are being promoted to either prevent or to fight uh, COVID-19. Uh, needless to say, there is no essential oil that will do that. But just before I, I let you have your spiel on this, I think we should uh, make people understand that in this case, the term essential does not mean that the human body requires it. It refers to essence. So the way that you get an essential oil is, is by heating up flowers or herbs or whatever, condensing the distillate. This is the essence of, of the product, and it's generally a mixture of, of fatty acids, some, some terpenes, some alkaloids, a mixture of many uh, things. And these are marketed through multi-level uh, companies. And, uh, you know, we've been looking into multi-level marketing for many, many years, and uh, I have uh, not come across any such company that uh, I look on favorably, uh, because basically what they are marketing is the ability to make money. That's what they are really selling. The product is, is incidental, uh, but the idea is to get people to market the product for you. You get a cut from whatever they're selling. It basically is a pyramid scheme, but of course they never refer to it by, by that term. And they show you these captivating videos of airplanes and cars and, and swimming pools that you can get if you sell enough. Uh, the fact is that virtually none of the people ever get to that uh, that level. Uh, almost everyone in multi-level uh, marketing makes less than $5,000 if they make anything at all. So the, the ones who are making the millions are very few and far between. All right, but now down to the business of uh, COVID-19 and essential oils. Jonathan. Yeah, I mean, it's it just, I, as you mentioned, aromatherapy is not new uh, and it's been I mean, it smells good. You know, if you have some lavender essential oil, it can smell very good. But then the, the problem that I have is when people start making health claims about them. Uh, and it's very easy to make them because there are uh, there are studies out there uh, of looking at essential oils uh, and their effects on cells in petri dishes. And they might say, oh, it looks like it has some antiviral activity. And then it's very easy for somebody to extrapolate that and say, oh, well, if you if you consume that, if you use that on the human body, it will kill viruses inside the body, but that you can't make that inference. You have to test it. And there was this one woman uh, here in Quebec uh, who got into trouble with the Federal Trade Commission in the United States because she was uh, selling a, a particular essential oil uh, of laurels, uh, oil of laurels, uh, to allegedly cure the coronavirus. Uh, and um, and so I was I was interviewed for for La Presse for uh, La Presse piece that came out uh, earlier today about this, and uh, I mean just just to show you how easy it is to to demonstrate that this is nonsense. I mean I just did a very quick Google search for laurel oil, and I looked at the first three websites that popped up. And I looked at, at the claims that were made on all three websites, and there were about 15 different claims, right? So this this oil of this one plant can allegedly give you courage. It can uh, help you breathe more easily. It can give you divinatory dreams. There was a long list of things that it can do. Um, I mean, if we've learned anything about medicine, especially now during this pandemic, and that is that one molecule or even a collection of molecules may have one effect, may have two effects, it probably doesn't have 15 positive effects on the human body. Uh, so if it sounds too, too good to be true, it probably is. Yeah, I'm also upset uh, by the fact that they're using the laurel plant in this argument uh, because of the connection to Nobel laureates. <laughs> the, reason, okay. the reason we call Nobel laureates laureates is it goes back actually to the ancient Greek and Roman tradition of wearing mm -hmm. laurel right. wreath as a sign of, of, of winning something. And uh, this uh, business about using uh, laurel leaves uh, or the extract of the berries to, quote, 
treat or cure COVID is not a winning formula. So I, I really object to the, the fact that they've picked on the Laurel plant. Incidentally, we should also uh, mention that the Laurel plant is the one that gives us bay leaves. And uh, for for the kitchen, for yeah, bay leaves are, are, are fine. You put them into your stew, uh, they will uh, give it a decent flavor. But remember to take them out because if you ever take a look, careful look at the bay leaf, it has essentially a needle in the middle, right? And if you swallow that that bay leaf, that can do significant damage to the esophagus. Is that why you're supposed to actually take them out? Because of course. Just because of the middle? Yes, there, there have been a number of case reports, um, several published actually in the New England Journal of Medicine about people having esophageal perforations from, from the bay leaf. But the actual so, leaf is okay, it's the middle. It's the middle, yes, yeah, so or when it's ground up, that's okay too. You can buy ground up bay, bay leaf oh. and use them. So remember when you cook your delicious meals, uh, take out the bay leaf before you Good. serve it uh, to Adam. Okay, or not. <laughs> sure, <laughs> depending on the day. <laughs> depending on the day, exactly. Uh, very interesting recent study about blood types and uh, the fact that people who have blood type O seem to be protected more from uh, from COVID-19 than, than people who have uh, blood type A. You know, it, it sounds kind of hokey, uh, but because, you know, there have been arguments before about various diets working sounds, better. It sounds very uh, hokey, actually. Yeah. Except that it's, it certainly has been uh, published uh, several articles in, in legitimate uh, journals where they looked at the epidemiological evidence. And uh, what they find is, is that... Uh, People who have blood type O have fewer complications from COVID-19. So I think it merits looking into further. Uh, we always say that, you know, more research is, is needed. You wonder if anything is ever known conclusively and seems seems not. But, uh, you know, before we uh, dismiss this, uh, yeah, let's have a look. I mean, obviously, uh, if you have one or the other blood type, there is a physiological difference there. So it's it's not outside the realm of possibility that, there, you know, uh, somehow uh, more an antibodies could be produced by one blood type than the other. Anyway, I just bring that up because it's an interesting uh, thing. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would be careful with this type of thing. Because I, I haven't seen the, the particular study. I, I don't know how many people, people they looked at, but there's always a danger when you do subgroup analyses, right? When you start to dissect your population into different groups. I mean, obviously it's very useful because there might be a connection. And so you want to see if it's there and, and can generate new hypotheses to be tested. But I'm reminded of the uh, the ISIS-2 trial from many years ago where they were looking at uh, giving aspirin uh, after a heart attack and the effect that it would have. And the authors wanted to warn the reader about these subgroup analyses. And so they wrote in their in their paper that they also looked at the astrological signs. And they saw that Gemini and Libra, I believe, did worse when they got aspirin after a heart attack. And the point that they were making is not that actually, yes, if you have those two zodiac signs, there, there's a risk. It's that when you start to slice and dice your data into subgroups, you might find positive associations by, by sheer luck. Right. So who knows? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you'll take take a, a more careful look at this study uh, because there are several actually that that okay. published along these lines. So who knows? It, it it could be interesting. But just getting back to the aspirin, let's just clarify this. There is significant evidence that if someone ha has had a cardiovascular event, then taking small dose of aspirin is beneficial in terms of preventing a second event. But there's no evidence that that healthy people should be taking. Uh, even small doses of uh, of aspirin. In fact, pr probably the the detriments outweigh any any um, any benefit there. Okay, Jonathan. Something else that I know that you've been looking at is uh, the toilet, and uh, <laughs> there, there's some interesting things that come up from the toilet. That's what Jonathan's been doing in his COVID time. Yes, I've been staring at my toilet for a lot of stories of the snakes coming up in. in you know, and because there's lots of YouTube videos about snakes coming up the toilet. No, we're talking about things going down the toilet yes. and uh, flushable uh, wipes. But just before yes. we there, there is some here. So, flushable or non-flushable, we'll uh, examine that. But uh, uh, just before that, there are some very serious studies about flushing and about the coronavirus getting into the air in the form of uh, aerosols from flushing. And there was a very interesting study that was just done on different designs of toilets because, you know, uh, uh, it depends on exactly how the water comes in and how the flushing happens. And, and if, if it is the type of toilet where the, the water 
kind of squirts in sideways, which some do, then you get this sort of twirling around of the water and that aerosolizes things more, more easily. Now, no one has shown that you actually catch the coronavirus uh, or that you get infected with it like that. Studies have shown that there are remnants of the virus in fecal matter, but no one has shown that they're infective. Uh, but it's something that one has to be aware of, especially because uh, in many hospitals and, and in public toilets, there's no lid. At home, of course, you can put down the lid, which you should always do when, when you flush. But in public toilets, there often isn't a, a lid. So I think it's, it's probably a good idea if you go to a public toilet to, to wear a mask and uh, not to go in right after someone has just flushed. But, you know, again, that's just sort of, I guess, uh, educated uh, guessing. But these are, all, course, these are all gonna be all the new, you know, design concepts and probably like future careers, you know, for these grads who are graduating in 2020 now. And Fred Moran talked about it last week in terms of restaurants and like just the new design of, whether it be booths again, like restaurant booths with like old school, you know, things to be, and not plexiglass, but nice, you know, designs they could do in between the booths and new toilet seats and covers and swishy ways and everything and things that Post pandemic we, uh, architecture and interior design. A hundred percent. It's a whole new career right there. Yeah. Okay. So let's get back to the flushable and non-flushable. First of all, flushable. I mean, everything is flushable. You know, it just doesn't mean that you should flush. If it's small enough, you know, it'll fit. But the question yeah. is, what happens, what happens after you flush it? Does it break down into small particles? Does it clog the system? And apparently millions of dollars are spent every year in North America on unclogging systems, which have become clogged with the so-called flushable wipes. Hundreds of millions of dollars uh, because we are creating what, are, what have been referred to as fatbergs. So icebergs of, of fatty matters that are accumulating because we're flushing down these wipes. Uh, that on, on the way down into the sewer, they accumulate sand and you accumulate food uh, residue, all kinds of stuff. And they create these gigantic masses of, of stuff that clog up the system. The reason why I wanted to look into this, because I, I was under the impression that there were no flushable wipes, uh, that, that whatever uh, was, was said to be flushable was actually not flushable, uh, because there, was, there has been ongoing media coverage about this for, for many years. But I recently saw... A, uh, a science video on YouTube that was sponsored by a particular brand that was advertising that, no, no, but their flushable wipes, they really are flushable because they do sort of disintegrate very easily when you flush them down. So I thought, well, maybe we do have new technology now. Uh, and so I started to dig into this and read, read papers and I got into, into, in touch with some experts who are, are studying this. And um, it's, very, it's very disappointing because it turns out that, um, first of all, a lot of these wipes have plastic or some sort of synthetic fiber uh, sort of woven into the, the, the pulp that is being used to make the core of it. Um, and that's problematic. I mean, it's there for durability, but, it, but it's problematic because it can break down into microplastics. And, and Joe, you're very well aware of the problem that microplastics can cause once they leach out into aquatic uh, ecosystems. We're still not sure if they cause actual health harm to animals and to humans, but but they're there and they're they're in very large quantities. So that's that's one problem. Uh, some scientists have looked at the the physical characteristics of flushable wipes versus non-flushable wipes. Right? What makes a wipe flushable versus one that is non-flushable? And they couldn't find a difference, like in terms of thickness, in terms of volume, in terms of everything that they could look at it. They just look like they were pretty much the same technically. Uh, and the problem arises because there is no real standard for flushability. Uh, there are standards, and, and there, there's a team that I've been in touch with, and they're trying to uh, get a Canadian standard going. But meanwhile, the industry that is making those wipes, they've come up with their own standards, but they don't have to abide by them. And so um, there was a very big study out of Ryerson, Ryerson University in Toronto uh, where they tried a whole bunch of flushable wipes and uh, you know flushable products in general versus non-flushable versus toilet paper. And the bottom line was that you know you should not flush anything down the toilet that is not toilet paper. Uh, now this new this company that is claiming to have these these all natural fiber uh, wipes that disintegrate very well uh, and they have no alcohol in them. Um, I'm, I'm very, because, because the, the thing that's a very interesting part of the story is that they, they, this company worked in collaboration with a sewage utility in Florida to make sure that their wipes would not clog up the system. 
But the issue is that that particular company, after after they announced the partnership and they announced the wipes, a year later, this company is still making videos and writing on their website that you should not be flushing down anything that is not toilet paper. So even that particular sewage ut utility that has worked in collaboration with that company is, is not saying on their on their official channels, yes, you can you can actually flush down these particular wipes. So the bottom line is. There seem to be some wipes that truly are flushable. Um, I, I know that there's, a, there's apparently one brand in Japan. There might be others. The team at Ryerson University has tested some of them, and some of them do seem to be flushable, but they are not available here in North America. So the technology is out there. Uh, but meanwhile, right now in North America, if you have wipes and you're wondering whether you should, you should flush them down or not, the answer is no, do not do that. You know, and this is a COVID connection because people are using far more wipes than, than ever. You know, I remember you know, the, basically the origin of the wipes was to wipe babies' bottoms. Yeah, baby and wipes. I, I had some experience with that. I mean, this, this goes back uh, Just to recently, many... Just recently, no? <laughs> well, I'll tell you about the recent one. Original. So the, the, the original ones go back to 42 years yeah. and 30 years yeah, and uh, then the technique was that that um, you uh, unravel the diaper, yeah. and then you use the wipe, and you leave the wipe in, in the, the diaper, and then you refold it and put it in the in the garbage, right? Which was uh, which was okay. Uh, I have had some recent experience. I uh, I kind of rusty on this, but I did change my grandson's diaper once, and. Uh, <laughs> This, it's. I, I guess it's kind of like riding a bicycle. You don't actually forget it, but you're a little bit wobbly when you get on but, it. To, but Joe, you know, I have to have it away for years. When when you used to do diapers back in the day, because my reference point is all baby diapers go in, all baby wipes go in the diaper and then in the diaper uh, right. wherever. But, but when you I, did it, when you did it for your kids, like back then, did did you guys just toss them? Like, did you flush them or toss them? No. No, we didn't flush anything. So you it didn't. Was, so you also didn't flush. So okay. it, was always, it was always put in the garbage. Okay. No, not, So these are basically the, the flush. People are flushing wipes that are not using them on babies. They're using it on themselves, or yeah, a, a lot of them are being advertised for this very esoteric phrase like personal cleaning. Yeah, like a fresh. I, 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 I think yeah, I think some people are using them as an alternative to bidet. Basically, if you don't have a bidet, you can use that, and it's yeah. they're, they're moist. <laughs> but, they, but you should not be flushing them. And they also uh, some. Uh, so in, my, in my more recent experience, I did discover that changing the diaper of a boy is not the same as girls, because my original experience was only with three girls. Uh, but with a like boy, a... it's quite different, because you do have to worry about that <laughs> golden shower, yes. which <laughs> which you don't yeah. have to worry about. There's, uh, there's some tips right. I heard they want us to deal with that. But actually, even on the uh, the Facebook stream, and we do have some comments. But someone said that seniors' residences are full of flushable wipes. So, you know, in the link with COVID and everything, that's something to, to think about also. Well, as Jonathan said, there are no such things really as, well, as uh, wipes. flushable right, wipes. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Uh, some other things that uh, have come up, uh, people asking about traveling on a bus and whether or not they should be wearing masks on the bus or metro. Yes. yes. And uh, about holding on to poles. Well, uh, I mean, if someone coughed on their hand, you know, they shouldn't be. I mean, they should be, you know, coughing into a handkerchief or into their elbow or whatever. But they coughed on their hand and held that pole and you hold the pole and then you touch your face. Yes, it, it's it possible. So I, 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 I think that people should go around with hand sanitizers. And if you did hold on to a pole, I think it's a good idea to sanitize your hand uh, after. I think, the, you know, it's not one of the giant risks, but... but uh, it is, it is something to be uh, considered. Even before COVID, that would have been something to be considered. From before COVID. Now, something else that came up very interesting about groceries, because people are ordering groceries online now, you know, all the time instead of going to the store. And the question is, is there a health connection here? Is there an environmental connection? And um, there was a survey that was done by the Center for Science and the Public Interest about what people were buying and how they were uh, making use of the ads that pop up on the grocery websites. And the analysis was that most of those ads are for what we would call junk food. Mm -hmm. And that, that when people are shopping online, they are 
buying into these things because they are pushed 50% off, nudged, you know, etc. And it's easy to click on it. So people are buying a lot of food that is not very nutritious. Hmm. So they calculated that by doing this kind of grocery shopping, people are act actually eating in a less healthy way. Wow. On the other hand, they also <laughs> calculated that this was environmentally friendly because there are far fewer people now driving to the grocery store. So therefore, there's less pollution due to the driving because there's much less driving involved in just the trucks going straight to the uh, grocery store and, and uh, uh, the delivered trucks. I'm not sure how they calculated this, but mm -hmm. they think that individuals use up more gas than one truck that drops off you know, in different uh, places. It's so, it's so funny because you were talking about, um, you know, people, maybe the online groceries kind of leads to unhealthy eating. But I was just having this conversation with my mother yesterday that we were ordering so much produce in my house and everything. And the same with that, with my parents. But it actually forces you to not impulse buy because I'm not, you know, if I go to the grocery store and I'm hungry or, or if I'm craving like chocolate almonds or something at the checkout counter and I'm just gra grabbing things this kind of forces you to confront what you actually like to eat and when you like to eat it. And even if it's, you know, chocolate or ice cream at X time of day in the night, if you want it, you better order it online and you're making like a conscious decision. So I actually find I'm, I'm, I'm buying much more consciously and planning out and not wasting, but I'm not sure if that's the same for everyone. Yeah, but you're not the average person. I'm not the, the average, average per person. <laughs> The average person buys into the 50% off your potato chips and say, okay, yeah. let's, uh, let's click on that. <laughs> All right. The uh, hydroxy story, hydroxychloroquine, uh, maybe the nail in the coffin this week when uh, uh, FDA and CDC said enough of this, uh, evidence has accumulated that it doesn't do uh, any good. And uh, Trump also has stopped talking about it. But interestingly enough, <laughs> there are people who are now suggesting that his bizarre walk down that ramp uh, you know, when uh, after he gave his, uh, his uh, speech, terrible speech, of course, and uh, when he had to hold up a glass of water and he had to steady uh, the glass of water with his hand, it is because uh, he's having uh, uh, fluctuations in his heart rhythm, uh, thanks to the hydroxychloroquine that he was taking. Well, I, 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 as as much as I think we would like to to uh, dismiss uh, Trump's ideas about the benefits of hydroxychloroquine, uh, I think this is jumping. Yeah. It, you know, to suggest that his his uh, problems are due to that. We don't know what his problems are due to, whether they're physical or mental. I mean, he's got all kinds of problems, obviously, but I, I don't think we can blame it on hydroxychloroquine. The The other thing is the dexamethasone story that uh, that emerged about uh, this being a, quote, life-changing drug. And this time, the term life-changing isn't as far-fetched as, of course, it was with the uh, game-changing connotation with the hydroxychloroquine. Although I don't know why anyone should be so surprised that dexamethasone has, has had an effect on, on COVID, because uh, dexamethasone, uh, a steroid, uh, has known anti-inflammatory effects. And we know that some of the very serious consequences of uh, COVID-19 are things like the cytokine storm, where the uh, immune system just goes into overdrive, and that's what does the, uh, that is, results in the problems. And uh, so there have been a number of studies now with dexamethasone given to hospitalized patients. We have to underline that trip three times, hospitalized patients. Dexamethasone will not prevent getting COVID. Uh, and if you just have the sniffles, you don't take dexamethasone. But in the case of uh, hospital patients who are either on oxygen, oxygen mask, or who have been intubated, what the study showed that dexamethasone actually reduced mortality. So uh, that is something that we want to look at because even with you know the the uh, uh, the people who were pushing uh, hydroxychloroquine, they weren't claiming reduced mortality. They were just claiming reduced symptoms. Or with remdesivir, they're just claiming, you know, some improvement in symptoms. But with dexamethasone, again, in hospitalized patients on oxygen or who are intubated, uh, the risk of death has been reduced. 
Has the has a study been published yet, or is it just a PR release so far? No, no there are a couple that have been published, and okay. there are some that are, are in press. But again, you know, there's some of the headlines, of course, have overstated the case. But uh, this is there's nothing novel here because uh, you know in hospital settings it, it, it's a common drug to use for respiratory problems. Uh, you know, so there's nothing really new here except that now they have noticed this in uh, uh, cases of uh, of COVID. Can, yeah, we just um, we have a question here on on uh, the chat that I think might be good to discuss. Um, and maybe it's a good follow-up to uh, our colleague, Dr. Chris Labos's article uh, this week about um, uh, household cleaners and washing fruits and vegetables. Um, so someone said, uh, you know, shouldn't we wash store-bought and farm stand vegetables and fruits with soap and water to at least kill bacteria, if not the virus, uh, and rinse well? We wash our hands, um, so this seems to be confusing. The mouth, throat are part of the respiratory system. When we say that the virus, you know, has to get into the respiratory system, um, if water water alone won't kill bacteria, so it also won't kill the virus. Maybe we could talk about that. Okay, there's no need to wash any kind of uh, uh, grocery with soap and water, and certainly not with with bleach. Uh, water will not kill bacteria. That is true, but rinsing with water will flush off of the fruits and vegetables, it will also do that to uh, to the virus. But in the virus, we're not so worried about ingesting it because as we said so many times, this is not an enterovirus. This is a respiratory virus. When you eat food that goes straight down the esophagus, it does not get to the at the back of the throat. That's where it needs to get more to have infection. There's absolutely no evidence there in all the tracing that has been done, and there has been a lot of tracing that has been done, there is no evidence at all from anyone getting this from eating food. So I think rinsing, which of course we should do all the time, because it will remove the bacteria from the surface. But not with soap. Uh, you do not want soap residues in your stomach uh, that uh, can cause problems, and you certainly don't want residues of bleach in your stomach. So yes, rinse well, but um, the evidence is that you should not be using soap and you should not be using uh, bleach and you should not be neurotic about eating because that is not the way that you contract uh, COVID. You may contract other bacterial borne diseases like that, but, uh, but not COVID. What, what happens when you ingest soap? Uh, trouble with soap is, is that uh, your, your uh, esophagus and your stomach uh, is lined with mucus and soap will dissolve the mucus. And the mucus is the protective layer around the esophagus and the stomach. You don't want that dissolved away uh, to be in contact with potentially toxic substances. Got it, okay. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, I've, I've been looking recently at the uh, amazing parallels between the so-called Spanish flu, 1918-1919, which of course should not be called the Spanish flu. It did not start in Spain. It probably started in the U.S., uh, but in those days there was censorship in the U.S. because of the war, and they didn't want to panic people, so they, they didn't write many articles about it. Spain was a neutral country. There was no censorship of the press at all. There was an outbreak in Spain. There was a lot of publicity about it. That's why it became Should we call it the American flu? Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I wish we could call it the Trump flu. <laughs> We, we, we don't have... He wasn't born yet. That. I mean, yeah. It doesn't yeah. matter. Just <laughs> blame him. <laughs> it was yeah, the best yeah. flu. It was yeah, a terrific yeah, flu. Yeah. I'm calling it the Chinese. Uh, right, in exactly. Fact. Yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, back in 1917, 1918, uh, amazing parallels to the current situation in, in many ways. Uh, you know, we, we think that the social distancing and wearing of masks and uh, uh, advising people not to gather that this is just a new development. Not at all, this is exactly what they were uh, recommending back in, in those days. Although they didn't know anything about viruses. Viruses would not be discovered until the 1930s with the electron microscope. But it was recognized this was a communicable disease. And Dr. Thomas Tuttle, who at that time was the health commissioner in, in the state of Washington, and who bears an uncanny physical resemblance to, to uh, 
uh, um, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Anthony Fauci. Uh, it's really when you look at I the sense a conspiracy theory now. <laughs> yeah. And when you look at what Tuttle was saying in 1918 and what Fauci is saying now, amazing parallels. Wow. No gatherings, wear, wear masks, you know, wash your hands constantly, don't sneeze on, on people. So they knew about this stuff. And in the state of Washington, where they actually abided by much of this, they had far fewer infections than elsewhere. Uh, there was a classic case in Philadelphia where they actually allowed uh, a parade uh, and the, um, the parade was to raise money for the war effort. And there was a whole host of infections after that parade, just like I suspect we're going to see now after all of these demonstrations in, in the US. So what was around tends to come around. And if we don't remember our history, as it has been said, we are condemned to relive it. And uh, there was a, a very interesting case that I just looked into and wrote about for next Saturday's uh, Gazette about a new movie opening uh, in 1918, a Charlie Chaplin movie. It was uh, called uh, uh, something arms, uh, shoulder arms, shoulder arms. It was not one of his classics. I mean, his great movie was The Dictator. And that's one, I, if you can find it online, I'm sure you can, you should look at that because that also has great parallels to America today. So take a look at The Dictator. But anyway, in 1918 in New York, the movie opened and there was a large opening. And this was at a time when people were already being advised against gatherings. But people loved Chaplin so much and they were so keen to go to this movie. And uh, they were actually urged to do that by the manager of the theater, I guess not surprising. And uh, unfortunately, it turned out that there was a big uh, number of deaths among the people who went to that uh, uh, opening night, including the manager of the theater, who also died from uh, wow. the, quote, Spanish flu. Well, so 100 years ago, this was happening, and it's happening today. Yeah, I actually heard, and I was just looking it up, um, I heard on a podcast recently, this woman, Karina Longworth, she um, looked at the movie industry in Hollywood uh, in 1918 and the Spanish flu um, and how that industry recovered and kind of went through it all and parallels to now because there's lots of talk about how is how our movie theater is going to recover, how award season, everything, you know, um, that whole experience. So it'll be yeah, I don't know what's going to be in a movie theater because some are opening next week. Yes. So are you going to be forced to sit six feet apart in the movie theater? I don't I, uh, know how any of these things can be viable, really, um, you know. And the other part of the movie industry is the making of movies right. and the making of, of TV shows. And uh, there was a whole list of, of TV shows that uh, came out which are not going to be, Because they, you know, they, they have to halt production. But there are other, there are other uh, production companies that have come out. Uh, one was Tyler Perry, um, who has like a massive compound. I, Actually, I don't know where it is. Um, maybe it's not in California. But um, how his next movie and everyone on it is going to be quarantined for two weeks. Um, they have to take their own private planes that Tyler Perry, I believe, is, is providing. Then getting there, uh, temperature checks before, after, quarantining. Like, it was so elaborate and a whole document and everything. And I'm, that's, otherwise, how can you film anything, right? So... And they're going to be filming fewer shows. There'll be less to watch, but we will be here. Yes. We right. can finally, we'll be, finally be able to catch up to, for, to, to the 500 exactly. TV shows that are in existence exactly, right now. Exactly, exactly. We will always be here on the Thursdays. Never mind what Netflix has, uh, we will uh, we'll be here. Uh, it's very hot out, and uh, people are asking about swimming pools. We did mention this before. Uh, there's no problem with the water, the virus. If, any of it is in the water, it's immediately diluted or killed by the chlorine. That's not, not the issue. The only issue in swimming pools is being close to someone, just like anywhere else. So it's more in the locker room that you want to be careful. Uh, you know. But again, what you have to remember is just passing by someone isn't going to transfer the virus. You have to spend some time in, in the vicinity of someone inhaling their exhaled breath. So I don't worry too much about going to the uh, to the swimming pool, uh, and you know you you also you even if there's some small risk, 
sometimes you know you have to say okay you know you're you're not going to live like a caveman so I actually, though, we talked about it with Dr. Debbie a few weeks ago um, about some gyms reopening in the States uh, and or maybe They're even in Canada. Of course, yes, they are. I just got an email from my gym uh, because they are opening on Monday. Um, I am not going to be going. I've, I have to. I did not tell anyone that yet, um, including the person who sent me that email. But um, it's going to be very interesting to see uh, how gyms can survive. I mean, some are smaller than others. Some are massive and maybe they're able to really distance their their equipment um i don't know i mean joe maybe you can what would what should we look yeah. for what gyms, sh what gyms, should we look for in gyms real problem a real problem because of course the more you exercise the more you exhale and the more sputum comes out uh, so if there's any any place where there's likely to be droplets in the air it's it's in a gym so as as much as i am keen to get back you know, to the gym and get on the on, on the treadmill. I don't think I'd feel comfortable, even if someone were running on three treadmills away. Uh, so I, I don't know how they're going to uh, to do this again, which uh, is different than outside, because the outside oh, passing by it, it's different than when you're in a pl in a room. I not worry outside. Uh, when I walk outside, I don't care if someone runs, you know, by me, no matter how heavy they are uh, breathing outside I, I think it's a totally different issue yeah. but indoors in the gym yeah I, I I'm just not comfortable uh, with that it's it's unfortunate because I would really love to to get back there but yeah. maybe uh, this is your time to embrace the outdoor experience or to I buy a treadmill for home. He has a treadmill. <laughs> oh, look at that. You need to get outside. It's been 15 yeah. years I've been telling you this. <laughs> the treadmill at home is not... It's not, not the same. Good. It's not the same. It's not, not the same. No. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I like the treadmill. I like to watch the numbers. I, I like to know the speed. I like to know exactly how much I've done. I and you know what I, what I also like is that I can stop whenever I want. And I think that's that's what I don't like about uh, running outside. You know, you you go or run two miles and then you you're there and you have to run back. Yep. Right? Yeah, that is the, that's true. I suppose I could just run around a few blocks, uh, yeah. etc. Yeah. Um, okay, um, I'm just looking to see if anyone anything else has come up while we were uh, uh, chatting in terms of. Uh, well, someone actually says um, that we're being told to wear a mask when we're social distancing, you know, if it's not possible. Uh, would this not apply when taking a flight on a commercial airline? But it does. We are, we are, we are supposed to be. Airlines are enforcing that um, very much so. I, I, they are giving out the masks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As, as and they've also cut out the middle seat. I mean, I was... Well... Well, yeah, I don't think they've all done that. Well I've, spoken, well, I've spoken with someone who works at an airline, and I know that, like, that, that I mean, if two people... I'm not sure. If two people, if a couple buys um, tickets, I believe that they're, they're seating two people per three-person row. So... All I'll say is that I, I saw a video from Vox, I believe, uh, where they showed photographic evidence that some airlines are not abiding right. by this rule. Yeah, I'm not sure all airlines are, but... Um, but some are, hopefully. But they, they, airplanes actually have a very effective filter system, air filter system. Yeah. But still, I mean, you're sitting with a lot of people in a, you know, in a closed container, yeah. right? But are those so, air filter systems something that eventually, again, we're talking about post-pandemic architectural yeah, design, interior design? That, HEPA filter, the, the high-efficiency particular resting filters, uh, dentist offices are installing them, doctor's offices are installing them. What about like uh, religious, you know, uh, pl houses of worship, since they happen to be very transmit transmissible there? That's another problem. Those are those are in the gym category. Also, yeah. another thing, Emily, is they're thinking of converting planes and just having open windows <laughs> so that the wind can go through. Right. Uh, they're experimenting with that. Right. We'll see what happens. Right. right. Well, we know what happens from Goldfinger. Remember the classic scene in Goldfinger? I've never seen it. I've never, never seen, seen it. Goldfinger? No, not not that one. No. Oh my goodness! There, there's your homework. <laughs> I, this, that's the best James Bond movie ever. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, and uh, well, anyway, the, I won't give this away. That uh, there's a scene in the airplane, and uh, there's a gunshot, and the gunshot shatters the window, and uh, Goldfinger gets his due and gets to meet his maker by being sucked out through the window. I see. A Goldfinger is is is, is just a 
it's a great movie. You you, you have to watch this. All right. Well, uh, let's just finish off with um, an interesting story from New Brunswick, uh, where they did not have uh, any new cases for quite a while. And then all of a sudden they had a number of new cases, which they traced to a physician. Mm. And uh, the physician had come to Quebec to pick up his daughter. But it was just an overnight trip. And uh, he claims that he did not encounter anyone so that it couldn't have been the Quebec trip. But being a physician, he thinks that he picked it up from a patient. But what we know is that they did the contact tracing and this physician did transmit this to something like 20, 20 people. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very noteworthy how one infected person can transmit this. But of course, this is a medical situation where, you know, there's close contact with, uh, with patients. So un unfortunately, uh, we have not solved all of the problems. And uh, just in case people didn't see the original demo, because maybe I held my hand too low. Can you see my hand now? Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now we will once again demonstrate our cumulative power. We'll go fishing. And this fish will tell us whether or not by the next time that we talk next Thursday, whether the COVID virus will have disappeared. Yeah. If the fish curls up, it means no. If the fish just lies there comfortably, it means that we will have no longer anything to worry about. It's our very own Groundhog Day. Right. Oh, too bad. That's really unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Can you ask? Can you ask the fish who will win the uh, November twenty twenty right. uh, presidential election? Yeah. <laughs> let's not see what the fish has to say on that one. <laughs> yeah, let's just urge people to. Let's leave it to the voters. Let's get yes, out and vote. Or, yeah. And hopefully they will know the right way to vote. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Uh, I think we had some fun here. We will be back with you next week. Uh, with another edition of uh, COVID nineteen conversations with. Uh, the McGill Office for Science and Society. And uh, again, as we always say, there will be something that happens between now and then that we will talk about in connection to COVID. And of course, there may be other issues that uh, arise as well. And remember that you can always go to our website, which is mcgill.ca slash OSS. You can sign up for our weekly newsletter by going to the website, which is a mixture of information and entertainment. And of course, it is all free. Jonathan's flushable wipes will be on there this week. Oh, they certainly <laughs> will. And uh, of course, we have a YouTube channel where you can see all of the previous COVID-19 plus more discussions. All right, Thanks. we'll head out back into the heat, 33 degrees out there. And uh, <laughs> well, at least some of the virus will be done in uh, by the heat, but uh, Again, outdoors, no reason to worry. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Signing Bye. off. Bye. Bye.